Okay, so today, today, um, because of the everything doesn't quite align, so today, um, instead of having you watch the video after the exam, I usually try and live lecture something. But that means that the pre-class quiz will now be a post-class quiz. So there'll be an online post-class quiz that'll be due for Wednesday. For in Wednesday's folder, I released the video and that online um, quiz. So Wednesday is up and running. Today, there's two, there's two topics that we've been on today's video. One is epoxides, which you already kind of did on your exam. But I'm going to come back to them. And then, the, and then we're moving into dyings. So that's what, the, um, that's what the handout that's very sparse at the beginning. But maybe we'll go a little bit farther. And that might make Wednesday's video even at one and a half speed. Maybe you've already seen a little bit of it. So here's... So instead of... And we have dienes, which are basically molecules with two double bonds in them. There are two different kinds of dienes. And I know you've got the handout that has a definition. So there are dienes where there are two single bonds between them, and there are double bonds or dienes where they alternate single and double bond. The first ones are called isolated, and the second one are called conjugated. And the issue with conjugated dienes is, well, they have a number of issues. But what the big one is that they don't react the same as an isolated diene. So if I have an isolated diene, I can react it with all the reagents that I could react a normal double bond with, except there's two. So if I said, oh, I want to take this isolated diene, it would be really helpful if it was symmetrical. And say, okay, let's add a Br2 to it, one equivalent. What would I get? Well make my choice of, of double bond. I would add two bromines, trans, in this case it's cyclic, so it doesn't really matter, to one of the double bonds if I added one equivalent. So the other double bond doesn't play a role. If I want to add another equivalent of bromine, I could do that. Add a second equivalent, and now I would have added bromine to each of the double bonds. And I think I'm missing. So isolated double bonds act independent of each other. And they're kind of boring. Because every reaction that I've done, I can still do. Okay. Now, the, it becomes a little trickier once we go to conjugated dienes. Okay. So what's the difference between isolated and conjugated? One of the differences is the reactions. The other is stability. So if I have these two double bonds and all I did was add a CH3 group over here, 
so that had the same molecular formula. It turns out that conjugated dienes are more stable than isolated ones. So whenever you put the double bond in conjugation, meaning it goes double, single, double, that's a more stable situation than having double and then multiple single bonds. Now we know that by simply doing some um, basically calorimetry experiments, by measuring heats of reaction. Because you may, so far I haven't really talked about how we do that, but how did I know that a more substituted double bond was more stable? How do I know that a conjugated double bond is more stable? It's relatively easy to do. What we do is we think of a reaction that both molecules can undergo. In this case, I'm going to say, well, they're going to undergo hydrogenation. So I'm going to take these two molecules that have exactly the same molecular weight, and I'm going to add two equivalents of hydrogen gas to them. Okay. So I can measure the I can measure the amount of energy that these reactions give off. So I need to know is the reaction endothermic or is it exothermic? Well, hydrogenation is an exothermic reaction. So that means on my energy coordinate diagram, my energy of my molecules is going to go down because it's giving off energy, right? So the key thing here is that if I'm going to measure the difference in those energies, I need to form the same product. I need to have sort of an energy oh, same, sort of that I need them to be the same. And they will be because when I add my two equivalents of hydrogen gas, what am I going to get? In that case, I'm going to get pentane. And over here, what am I going to get? I'm going to get pentane. So I can go ahead and I can measure the energy difference between these two molecules. And what I find is that my delta H of hydrogenation that my delta H of hydrogenation of the isolated double bonds is larger and more negative. So it's more exothermic when you react a when you react an isolated double bond or isolated diene with hydrogen gas. So what that means is that means that this energy, because this is really the delta H of reaction, and then this energy for the alkene, or for the conjugated alkene, there's a difference there. And so it turns out that the isolated is more exothermic. So there's a greater delta mi, greater delta H. So if they both start the same place, that means going up, that this has more energy, this has less energy, and the molecule that has more energy is more unstable than the molecule that has less energy to begin with. More negative. Because it's, it's more exothermic. So then the difference here, this difference between the two molecules then would represent how much more the diene, the conjugated diene, is more stable than the isolated one. And I'm not getting into the exact number of kilojoules or kilocalories per mole because quite honestly, you don't care at this point.
right? You just know that there's a difference. Because even if you knew the difference, what does that mean? So what we're going to do is we're just going to say, okay, conjugated, more stable than non-conjugated or isolated. Okay, but this is how we can actually determine how much more or less stable a molecule is by basically hydrogenating it and measuring the heat of the reaction. So we do the same thing if we wanted to do a more stable molecule versus a less stable molecule, like more substituted versus less substituted. We just have to make sure they have the same molecular weights and they go to the same products because this is kind of our basement, the same level for each one. Because if I've got two different levels and I can't quite figure out what's what, then I have no idea which one's more or less stable. So this sets the baseline, and then we go up from there. Sometimes the baseline might be the reactants, and then you go down or you go up because it's an endothermic reaction. But the key is something has to be the same, whether it's endo or ex, or whether it's reactants or products. So a conjugated diene is more stable than, a, than an isolated one. And that's how we would get that. That's the first time we've talked about that. Does that make sense to everybody? So, conjugated dienes are more stable than the isolated ones. Now, that's a fact, but why? So, we next have to go to our diagrams, and we have to say, okay, here is a conjugated diene. This is one 3 butadiene that we're making in lab this week. Having just typed, having just typed out the lab procedure for my lab, or modifying slightly what I've done in the past. So this is one. This is called one three butadiene, or butadi one three. So it's conjugated. Now, when I look at that butadiene, what's the hybridization of all of the carbon atoms? SP2, we all agreed SP2? Yes, no? No? Somebody say no. So they're all SP2, which means they have what? Which means they have unhybridized P orbitals. And so the beauty of the 1,3-butadiene is that they're all sp2, and all those p orbitals are aligned parallel to one another. So the top picture is a better picture of what it looks like. But what we have is we have these two, these two orbitals sharing a pair of electrons to form a double bond, these two sharing a pair of electrons to form a double bond, but what happens in a conjugated system is that the middle two carbons can partially share the multiple bonds. So there's like a partial overlap of those two carbons. Not enough to create a double bond, but not, not enough that it's just a single bond. And so this partial overlap then is what makes the molecule stable. So I, I think within the last five or six years, I think, that they've actually observed the evidence for this happening. It's been in textbooks for a long time. 
but there's a guy over at Oberlin who does really high resolution infrared spectrometry. Not only, he has to go to Germany to use an instrument, him and his students. But what they showed was that they showed that this actually, this bond was just a little bit shorter than what it would be predicted to be for a single bond. And so they were actually able to measure that bond distance by using infrared spectroscopy, which is, I think, some of the first evidence that this really occurs, despite the fact that it's in every textbook. So it's true now that we have evidence until somebody comes up with evidence contrary. But that partial double bond, then, that's what causes the molecule to be more stable. And you can kind of get some evidence of that. The red is kind of where the electron density is. So what you can see in the picture is the red kind of shows that there is partial overlap throughout the entire series of, of pi bonds. Okay. So that's how we get conjugated dienes. That's why they're more stable, because there's a partial overlap. So that's all, that's all great and good, but what, what does it mean for the reactivity? Well, let me just give you a beginning part of the reactivity and the issue. So let me take my conjugated diene, and I'm going to add, I'll add HCl to it. And I've got carbons 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, and carbon 4. So let's write a mechanism. What should I do? I'm stuck. It's been a long weekend. Unfortunately, not grading your exams yet, so don't ask. <laughs> so if you ask me what you got, it's 10 points lower than what you had at the beginning of not asking me. What should I do? Okay. Add H plus to a double bond. Which one you want to add it to? One, two, or three, four? Okay, doesn't matter, true. One, two. All right, what's my next question going to be? No, we're not to CL yet. Yep. So where should I add the H plus? Should I add it to carbon one or add it to carbon two? Carbon one? We all pretty much in agreement? If I add it to carbon two, what happens? Here, no, I can, and I'm going to. So I'm going to add my H plus to carbon one, and I'm going to add my H plus to carbon two. Okay, so left I added it to carbon two, right I, or carbon one. Right, I added to carbon two. Why can't I add it to carbon two? Because I form a primary carbocation, right? You can say, well, that's anti Markovnikov, but remember, Markovnikov, anti Markovnikov is all based on whether you add Markovnikov or anti Markovnikov, it's all based on the mechanism. And the idea here is to do what? Is to form the most stable carbocation or intermediate. That's the real reason behind Markovnikov, to form the more stable intermediate. Okay. I might as well change the molecule up. That's a trap. Uh, 
I'll go ahead and change my diene, my conjugated diene to that one. So, where do I add the H plus? Two. Okay. I'm going to again add H plus to both. So I'm going to add my H plus to carbon one. And then I'm going to add my H plus to carbon two. Now, we've got A and B here. I've got C and D for that reaction, just to keep them different. So we said for the left reaction that we were going to add the H plus to carbon 1, right? So why is that? Because A is more stable than B. Okay. So you know I'm going to go to the next reaction and I'm going to say, okay, so I could either add to carbon 1, add the H plus to carbon 1 or carbon 2, which makes me two different carbocations, C and D. Which one of those two carbocations is more stable, C or D? Maybe we need cards. Let's pull out the cards. C or D? Okay, are we ready? Which one's more stable, C or D? I got 20 D's and two C's. I'm interested in one of the two people that said C. Anybody want to identify themselves as one of the two people that said C? Okay, why did you say C? You guessed. Okay, so one guessed C. Did somebody else not guess C? Somebody had a C. No? Made your chance to look good. You were looking good until you said you guessed. Yeah. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> um, is it? Uh, can you tell me why? I know you're going to get to that. No, I know I'm going to get to it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to well, get to. Am I correlate with why I think C? Like I can't well, have uh, guess, but I have. Well, what what you got? Um, I don't. Know. I'm sorry. You sure? Yeah, I'll take the credit though. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. It don't work that way. <laughs> well, the answer is C. The answer is C, that it is more stable than D. In the same way that A is more stable than B.
but we've got to go deeper than A is secondary and B is primary. We got to go. We got to go into that a little bit deeper. Yes, that it's internal, but why, right? It's next to the double bond. I like that. Resonance. Resonance. I like that. So we did. So we did mass spec in lab a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, did, or or longer. <laughs> so it turns out that. The reason A is more stable is not just because it's secondary. It's because I can do this. I can move the pair of electrons from the double bond, and I can do what? Form a resonance structure. Yeah, I mean, I do form a primary carbocation, but here's the thing. That's not just a primary carbocation. This position, the position next to the double bond. So if I have a double bond with a carbon next to it, what position is that called? I know, lab, lecture, they're not supposed to go together, but they do. Right. And I'm sure this word might have been used in the other, in some of the other lab sections I know was used in mine. Brian? That's the allylic position. So the allylic position is a position next to the double bonds. And if you put a carbocation on the allylic position, you could form a second resonance structure. So A is not just secondary. A is secondary allylic, which means that it has a second resonance structure. Okay, that secondary resonance structure is primary allylic, but it doesn't matter. I got two resonance structures. And that's what's really contributing. It's not just secondary versus primary, it's secondary with another resonance structure versus primary with nothing else. Does that make sense? So now we go to C and D and what do we get? Well for C and D I've got a tertiary carbocation which is D but what if I draw my resonance structure My second, my second resonance structure, guess what? It's tertiary too. But now I've got a second resonance structure. So more resonance structures, more stable. So that goes beyond just primary, secondary, <coughs> tertiary. Now I have the ability to write resonance structures. The more resonance structures I can draw, the more stable it is. So if you go back to the mass spectrometry, when you had a double bond, you were most likely to cleave the molecule to give you an allylic carbocation that you could write the resonance structures for. And again, I don't know if I actually suspect that at least Dr. Dowd went into that level of detail. I know I did. And I think in the other two it was probably mentioned as well. But here's, here's the reason. So what I'm going to conclude from this is that whenever I'm adding a nucleof or sorry, an electrophile to a conjugated 1,4 system, 1, 2, 3, 4, I'm going to always add that H plus or whatever that E plus is 
to carbon one or carbon four. But I'm never going to add in the middle. Always add to the end. And why am I going to add the electrophile to the end? Because I form a carbocation that's got resonance structures. Does that kind of make sense? Yes, no? Confusion? Still not going to tell me who the other person who said C was? You've had your opportunity to shine. <laughs> you could you could have just stopped at the you could have just stopped at raising your hand. Alright, um you said that you want to add the the to the end or any other structure and you said something about resonance, you said just because I'm gonna to add to carbons I always add to the end because I end up with a structure that has resonance structures. So that's the that's why we have to add. And remember Markovnikov's rule said, I add the electrophile to where? The carbon that gives me the most stable intermediate. So the most stable intermediate is going to be the one that has the resonance structures. So even in the one on the right, I'm still, I always take and count out my four carbons, one, two, three, four, and I can always add to either carbon one or carbon four. And I'll give you symmetrical structure, so it won't matter. Because if you have two, if you have it's unsymmetrical, then you got to add to one, get all your products. Add to four, get all your products. Okay. All right. So let's do that. Because I have a complication now. So when I add my H plus to carbon 1, I form that carbocation, which then I can take my pair of electrons and move over, and I make that carbocation. So I don't, I don't get to do this reaction live anymore. It's on. It's always on video. So I don't get to see how people do when I ask them questions like, which set of which one's more stable. Which is okay, right? Even though nobody got it right, we hadn't had that idea introduced yet. The idea that we had resonance structures. Although it wasn't loud. But anyway, now we know. So I want to complete the reaction. So I've got two resonance structures here. They aren't the real intermediate, right? The real structure of the intermediate is what? The resonance hybrid. All right, let's draw it. So if I draw the resonance hybrid, I'm going to have a delta plus charge. And then I'm going to have partial double, partial double bonds. Okay, so when I write the resonance hybrid, what do I do? Average charges, average bonds. So, so this carbon plus zero delta plus. End carbon, zero plus delta plus. Other carbon, zero, zero, average, zero. Double bonds, partial on the left, partial on the right, in between the two delta pluses. So that's my real intermediate, right? But here's the thing. I want to add Cl minus. So how do I deal with adding a Cl minus to delta pluses with partial charges? So let's simplify it. And let's treat the resonance structures as if they were real. Let's just react each one. Because we certainly know how to do that, right? 
We know how to do, and oh well, wait, this is SN1. This was last semester. So now I'm going to take my Cl minus, add it to this carbon, product one. Take my Cl minus, add here, product two. And there's my two products of the reaction. Am I done? No. Because I now have two products. So what's my next question going to be? What's the major product? Anybody want to propose what the major product of the what the major product is? Do I have a vote by card? Let's vote by card. <laughs> Which one of those two is going to be the major product? A or B? Well, what do you want to see? You want them both? You just want A or B? Let's just do A or B. I don't know. Let's find out what people say. Right? This is science. It, we determine the correct answer by polling people. <laughs> oh, that, sorry, that's social science, not science science. Although we're going to get to that day someday. I got a ten. And, I got eleven, eleven, eleven A's and eleven B's. And guess what? You're both right. <laughs> I didn't say that. I didn't say it was 50-50. Right? I didn't say it was 50-50. I said you're both right. So the true answer here is, which one of those two major, of, of those two is the major product? And my answer is, it depends. What does that mean? Well, actually what it means is if I change the reaction conditions, I can get a majority A. And if I change the reaction conditions again, I can get a majority B. So it's not 50-50. It's going to depend on the reaction conditions. But now I'm going to ask a question because you split up 11-11. So somebody tell me why they chose A. And we've already seen that I held up the wrong cards edge or that I just guessed not acceptable answers, okay? But why did you choose A? Josh? I could be wrong here, but I, I don't and don't start your question. Don't start your answer with I could be wrong. Okay, because so. you we know that's the case. We know you <laughs> could be wrong. Okay. So Any I, answer could be wrong. I chose A because the C that the C L is Bonded to is a secondary versus a primary. Okay, secondary, secondary versus primary carbon. carbon. Can somebody take that answer a little bit deeper? Or you can. It's allylic, but the CL added to a C plus, right? Yeah. So what kind of C plus is that? I know it's allylic. It's Blank allylic. Secondary allylic. Now, what's the other one? Well, hold on, hold on to that. I'm going to come back to that. Because that's why you chose B. Yeah. We're not done with A yet. So, if you're choosing to add the chlorine to the secondary allylic versus the primary allylic is a precedent for, for choosing to react the nucleophile with the more stable carbocation. Is there a precedent for that in the past? Yes. What kinds of reactions? SN1, the second part of like E1, or a second part of, of alkene addition. So there's precedent for that, right? 
reacting the nucleophile with the most stable intermediate. Okay. So that's a perfectly sound answer. And then Reem, you said you chose B because because it's an internal alkene versus a what's a terminal. terminal. What does that what does that mean? More stable. Why is it more stable? This is more substituted, which means B is the more stable product. Right? Now you say, well, what about the chloride? I don't remember any rules for chlorides. I don't remember us ever saying a primary, secondary, tertiary chlorides were more stable than the others. I certainly remember more substituted alkene more stable than less substituted alkene. So when I'm looking at the products, I'm looking at this and I'm saying, hey, this is the more stable product. And when I choose the other reaction, it's because this is the more stable intermediate. So I have quite the conundrum. Because one product comes from the more stable intermediate, and the other product comes from the more stable product. So they're kind of fighting each other. And so what, it de so what the reaction really depends on are the reaction conditions. And you might say, well, how, do you, how do you do that? Well, let's take our two reaction conditions as reaction time. Okay. Short time, long time. 15 minutes, two days. So let's, let's draw a little diagram. So here is my, and sadly what it has to be is, it has to be the interme it has to be the resonance structure resonance hybrid but here's my resonance hybrid okay because this is really what it looks like so i'm going to add my cl minus to the right hand carbon to the primary carbocation now we said the primary carbocation was less stable but here's how I'm going to modify that statement and say that the transition state for reacting the chloride with the primary C+, plus, that transition state is going to be higher than the transition state of reacting the Cl- minus with the secondary carbocation. Because remember, what does the chloride want to do? I'm back to here, right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to go back to this. We, we don't like to deal with this, but we're going to have to. We're going to deal with the, with the resonance hybrid. My chloride is a nucleophile. Which carbon does it want to react with? It's electron rich. What does it have to give to? the absolute electron poor. Which one of those two carbons is it? The secondary or the primary? It's the secondary. Right? I feel like I feel like this is deja vu. Does anybody else have that feeling? You probably I should be thinking this is deja vu. But where have we talked about the nucleophile reacting with delta positive carbons. 
Thank you. Epoxides. Right? And so what we said was that the nucleophile had that had to the carbon that had the most delta positive charge. Now what I'm saying here is that if when it reacts with the carbon that has the least delta positive charge, you know what I'm going to pay for that? I'm going to pay for that with extra transition state energy, with extra activation energy. If my chloride wants to react with the least with the carbon with the least delta positive charge, I pay for that with more with more activation energy. I'm going to have to climb a higher hill. But on the other hand, if I want to react with the carbon with the most delta positive charge, I'm going to get a break on my activation energy. Does that kind of make sense? Let's see. Okay. Reaction time. Which hill is it is the reaction going to go over faster? Does it go over the left faster or the right faster? Left? Why? Less activation energy. Then we have to then we got to drag out the Arrhenius equation, right? The rate goes faster when the activation energy is lower. So that means that if my if I change my reaction time, right, and I let it just go for 15 minutes, well, I'm going to get mostly addition to the secondary carbocation because that's the one that's going to form fastest. At least we all can be in agreement. The secondary, the chlorine adding to the secondary carbocation is going to be the fastest reaction. Right? We all agreed on that? Yes. Okay. So if I let the reaction go for a short period of time, I'm going to get more two than one. Then you might say, well, oh, how do you get more one than two? Because that seems like that's, that's pretty much end of the game. Right? So what I do is let's just throw in the stabilities of the products. So when it adds to the secondary carbocation, it's not as stable as if it adds to the primary one because having the double bond... internal and having the double bond terminal that this product is more stable than this product. Now we've done reactions where the more stable product has been the major product of the reaction, right? <coughs> yes? And how did we get that more stable product? Well, now let's talk temperature. So let's talk temperature. What? I was going to ask, what if you had a catalyst? Uh, you're going to complicate things more than I want to. Okay. Actually, you're not, but because remember, a, ca a catalyst doesn't affect the position of the equilibrium; it only affects how quickly you get there. But I like the catalyst idea because now I had I had to say the word equilibrium because guess what I have? I've got two equilibria. Because here's what happens. Okay, so reaction temperature time, we're like short time, 
going to get more left and right. We're in agreement with that. But then you could, but I can't overcome that with temperature, can I? If I raise the temperature, what happens? I'm still going to get more two than one. I might get 50-50, right? That's the birds flying over the mountains, and the supersonic birds can go over any mountain they want at the same time. <laughs> well, you've never heard the super, you've never heard the birds going over the mountain. Yeah. But that's basically what's happening, right? Birds going over the activation energy. The more energy you give them, the quicker they go over. At some point, those rates converge, but they're never quite the same. They're close enough to make it 50-50. But notice, I never made it. The product on the right is the major product. So if I raise the temperature, I'm going to get 50-50, but I'm actually going to do better than that. Because here's the problem. The problem with this reaction is that I can take that chlorine and I can have it leave. It's an allylic chloride. So if this chloride leaves, what do I get? I get a secondary allylic carbocation, which is in resonance with the primary allylic carbocation, which means I just did what? I just went this way. So now I've got a second activation energy if I want to reverse the reaction. And so what happens is, is if you give this reaction a lot of energy and a lot of time. You may get stuck on the left, but then you're going to reverse yourself and go back to the right. But then you might go over the right hand barrier all the way down to here. And guess what happens when you're down there? You're stuck. Because the barrier to go the barrier to go from the right product, that barrier is much bigger. And so while you initially may start with the secondary allylic product, give enough time and energy, you're eventually going to end up in the sink on the right-hand side because you're not going to be able to overcome that huge barrier to get you back to the intermediate. And so the critical part of this is that this re these two reactions are reversible. And one of these products we call the kinetic product. That's the product that forms the fastest. And we've got a thermodynamic product, which is the most stable. And so if I choose the conditions right and I play with this diagram, I can choose the product that I want by playing off the activation energies, playing off the stabilities. Okay. So that's what's different about this reaction. Now, there's a much less compelling video version of this for Wednesday, I'm sure, that you can probably play at double speed now. Or maybe play at one speed if you just if it, something's lost here. But we're going to talk about writing these products and then choosing the major product on Wednesday. So on Wednesday, what will be due is electronic online that was due for today, which is epoxides, it's reactions of epoxides, and then Wednesday, Wednesdays after you've watched the video. And if you have questions, by all means, bring them in on Wednesday, and we will go over them. <laughs>